it is my profound honor to be able to welcome all of you to this very, very timely conference call. Um, unfortunately, we have all seen within the last few weeks how anti-Semitism has been managing to penetrate even into um, the United States government, and um, we have seen how some of our elected officials have been able um, to get away and actually capitalize on some classic anti-Semitic smears. Um, and um, we have with us today a really excellent scholar and researcher, Dan Diker, who is going to talk about how um, anti-Semitism has crept into um, our nation's college campuses, um, how many of our nation's um, respected professors have um, been perpetuating classic anti-Semitic tropes and have basically found common cause with um, terrorist groups and even been associated with um, terrorist groups, um, how it has penetrated into the international arena, um, and um, what we can basically do about this. Um, Dan Diker is a fellow and a senior project director at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, which is probably the paramount institution um, that I turn to um, in Israel for all sorts of phenomenal policy briefs. And um, I'm fortunate enough to be friends with many of the scholars. Um, Dan is the director of the Program to Counter Political Warfare, MBDS. Um, he has just authored several books on the global BDS movement. Um, um, BDS Amassed, which I feel is just because it's 2016, and Students for Justice in Palestine Unmasked um, in 2018, as well as Defeat and Denormalization, Shared Palestinian and Israeli Perspectives on a New um, Path to Peace in 2018. Dan is also a research fellow at the Institute International Institute for Counterterrorism, which is part of the IGC at Herzliya, where he hosts Counterterrorism Today on IGC International Ra Radio. Um, he has survived some um, interviews where people have threatened him um, on international media outlets, including Al Jazeera, BBC, Fox, and Russia Today. Um, Dan previously served as Secretary General of the World Jewish Congress, which is the global diplomatic organization representing Jewish communities in 100 countries. Dan received his BA cum laude from Harvard and pursued his MBA at the Harvard Graduate School of Business um, before making Aliyah and receiving an MA in Government and Counterterrorism Policy Summa Cum Laude from the IDC in Herzliya. Um, he immigrated to Israel in 1990 and is blessed um, with a beautiful wife, Afera, and five children. So without further ado, it is my um, esteem, honor, and um, privilege to be able to hand the um, forum over to you, Dan. Sarah, thank you ever so much for inviting me uh, to share a few thoughts. Uh, some observations, comments, and assessments with uh, friends and members of uh, of Emet. Um, we're living in this week is the week of uh, Emet of, of Emet of Truth uh, Purim, unmasking, wearing costumes, and unmasking the truth about uh, about uh, Israel's historical adversaries and enemies and current uh, and current challenges as well. Um, as the former Secretary General of the World Jewish Congress, there, th this convergence of uh, classical and new anti-Semitism on the one hand, and what we have known as the delegitimization of Israel on the other, uh, and and as a third um, ingredient, the legitimate criticism of Israel. All of these, uh, all of these issues, have now converged in a 
a very visceral way following the mid-February comments by a uh, member of the House, Ilhan Omar, and supported uh, as well by Rashida Kleibe uh, from Michigan. And it, were, it was the comments of these two members uh, of the House that concerned us uh, very much in, in Israel for the following reason. What we noticed wasn't only that uh, for the first time ever uh, in the history of, uh, I think, the American Congress, um, classical anti-Semitic comments, one after the other, were made uh, by, uh, you know, by made by members of the House that were, were, were elected barely a month and a half earlier. Um, not to mention the fact that, it, that such comments had never been made by an elected representative of the United States Congress. Um, but that of even greater concern, we noticed that there was a depreciation of classical anti-Semitism because of the inability of the Democratic Party to pass a resolution that was uh, based on clear classical anti-Semitic tropes, number one. And number two, and this is, this is where Israel comes in, there was this conflation or confounding, this mixing, this confusion uh, of what Ms. Omar had said and what Ms. Flybe had said with, with what has become known as the legitimate criticism of Israel. In other words, if you look at the criticisms of members of the House, Flybe and Omar, by progressive critics of Israel, uh, such as Peter Beinhardt or, or J Street, you will find them um, criticizing these two members, but at the same time launching um, very harsh criticism against Israel using the same type of language uh, that would be called anti that, that would be called anti-Semitism if it were launched against an individual Jewish person in the United States. Bigoted, racist, apartheid, these types of these types of uh, adjectives um, that we found uh, to be in direct violation of the 2010 State Department definition on anti-Semitism, which was the building block for the 2016 um, universally accepted IHRA, H-I-H-R-A, International Holocaust Remembrance Association definition of anti-Semitism, which as uh, Ambassador uh, or Special Representative Elon Carr, who's the President's Special Representative on anti-Semitism, has said that, that those are the working definitions that the United States government and, and most European countries are, have accepted today as working definitions for anti-Semitism. So, so, so therefore, we see, in short, Israel in the middle. If you, can, if you can just imagine in your mind's eye for a second, Israel in the middle, anti-Semitism on the, on the left side, legitimate criticism on the right side, BDS on the northern, uh, on, uh, to the north, and then delegitimization to the south. It's this convergence. Of, of tensions that we're trying to understand uh, in Israel, define them, and also define the limits of what's called the legitimate criticism of Israel, because we are seeing that uh, a lot of the comments that, that came out of, resulted uh, in, in Omar and Flybe's comments um, that were then masqueraded as, but this is just a legitimate debate about Israel. This is just legitimate criticism about Israel. These were very clear violations as we understood them, um, and uh, you know, as, as we took out the definitions, both of the 2010 report, the State Department, as well as the 2016 IRA definition of anti-Semitism. So what we did, um, Sarah and, and other friends of Ahmed, is that, is that we had a roundtable. It was an unprecedented strategic roundtable just last week here at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs to discuss the question that I just posed to you, these tensions uh, between anti-Semitism, delegitimization, BDS on the one hand, and, and the actual legitimate criticism of Israel on the other, and to try to find – what, what are the uh, what are the dimensions of the of the discussion? What's legitimate? What's not legitimate? What are the red lines uh, uh, in, in this discussion? And so we pulled together uh, Natan Sharansky, former prisoner of Zion, former deputy prime minister and and uh, minister with a number of portfolios, uh, as well as the professor Asha Kasher, 
who was the, the, the most important ethicist in Israel. He drew up the ethical code for the IDS, IDF, and a number of different uh, – Alan Professor Dershowitz joined us, um, and uh, a number of other leading scholars, including uh, Dory Gold. Um, I was uh, the host of this uh, event, and, and it was under Dory's sanction as the president of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, former U.N. ambassador and former uh, director general of foreign ministry, um, and uh, uh, Professor Daniel Gordis from Shalem, and a number of others. And I want to share with you that a number of the principles emerged from that roundtable last week, which I'd like to apply to our discussion uh, here today and, and my briefing for the next just few minutes before we open up for, for discussion and questions. And that is, number one, anti-Zionism, meaning, me, meaning the, uh, the accusation that Israel, uh, as the nation state of the Jewish people, shouldn't exist or that, or that Zionism is racism. Um, you know, th these are anti-Semitic because this is an, or, or Israel's an apartheid state or Israel's a racist state or Israel's an illegitimate uh, state or a criminal state or, or, or a state that, that is genocidal, as is regularly discussed in more progressive circles um, in the United States and in Europe uh, regarding what Israel is. Well, that type of behavior, those types of nomenclatures are um, overtly anti-Semitic and should be called out as, as anti-Semitism. Nathan Sharansky raised, um, raised an important issue. Uh, when he was jailed by Brezhnev in, uh, 19, in the mid-1970s for nine years and placed in solitary confinement because he was a Jew that wanted to live in the Jewish state, uh, he pointed out that the Russian authorities that had adopted Stalin's uh, principle of, you know, Zionists are Jews and Jews are Zionists. Uh, that, you know, this uh, really characterized in the sharpest possible terms that anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism are one and the same. And, and uh, Sharansky last week called that the, um, the, 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 red, uh, the new red anti-Semitism as it had been discussed as early as the early 1950s uh, in the former Soviet Union. So that anti-Semitism is anti uh, Anti-Zionism is a, a, the most prominent form of the new anti-Semitism, um, and that uh, uh, that's number one. Number two, the the second principle that came out that perhaps we can talk about on this phone call during uh, during the time we have together is is the, is the need to sharpen these two uh, working definitions of anti-Semitism because when it comes to the inclusion of the Jewish state uh, in the uh, in the listed definition of the anti-Semitism, the, the language seems uh, somewhat um, in, un, unsatisfactory, uh, and that there was a the a need, there was a determination around the table that we should work on the legitimate criticism, on, we should work on the definition, uh, to sharpen the definition of anti-Semitism with regard to Israel uh, directed anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism. And the third conclusion that emerged from the roundtable we held here at the Jerusalem Center last week is that we should define clearly what is legitimate, what are the goalposts for the legitimate criticism of Israel. Well, in the discussion with Professor Dershowitz, what, what emerged was that it's important when criticizing Israel uh, to demonstrate a quality or symmetry of, cri uh, of criticism, um, which would which would not be criticizing Israel as a function of creating a double standard, meaning only Israel. But if Israel, um, if, if there's an Israeli policy, a specific policy or a specific action, that those policies and actions should be uh, critiqued in context, in context with what Israel's um, adversaries are doing, if they're doing that or if they're doing it worse, and what other countries around the world are doing in exactly the same position that Israel might find it, that Israel finds itself. Um, the point is not singling out Israel because it's the nation state of the Jewish people, which seems to be the, uh, the quote-unquote gold standard among, uh, among critiquers of Israel who call Israel an apartheid state or a bigoted state or engaging in apartheid policies. Besides the fact that these are, these are mendacious claims, um, they they're clearly are based on double standards. And that brings me to the final point about this roundtable, and that Sharansky – um, who, as many of you know, in working closely with the American ambas Israel's ambassador to the United States, currently Ron Dermer, who some years ago came up um, with what they called the three Ds, um, that if, if 
um, if Israel or the Jewish people were subject to demonization, delegitimization, or double standards, those would be constituent ingredients for anti-Semitism, and specifically with regard to Israel. Um, delegitimizing Israel uh, by calling it either the, using these types, of, uh, these types of nomenclatures as to what it is, uh, demonizing uh, Israel the way Israel is consistently demonized when it's forced to defend itself, whether it, uh, opposite um, terrorists in Gaza trying to tear apart the fence and, uh, and penetrate into Israeli territory to kill and kidnap Israelis, uh, ha as has been happening every single week since March 30th of 2018, uh, and then and then um, and, and using double standards, uh, meaning isolating Israel uh, for a unique uh, criticism among the nations, uh, uh, without creating context or symmetry with other countries or other situations um, uh, that uh, uh, that would reflect the specific situation that Israel finds itself. Uh, in which Israel finds itself. Now, let me just move for a moment because we're only we're taking, let's say, 10 or 12 or 15 minutes to do the initial. My initial comment would be to share with you um, what what we have, I think, has been an overlooked issue. And I think that we in Israel, the, even those of us who analyze um, this tension between BDS legitimization and uh, anti-Semitism, have been guilty of overlooking. And that is that. The, the, the BDS, uh, what's called the BDS movement, Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, is really, uh, which is really a destroy Israel, as the nation state of the Jewish people movement, has uh, its DNA is really a terror DNA. Uh, what do I mean by that? When the BDS movement was founded back in 2008 as a, as a national committee, BDS National Committee in Ramallah, the first constituent member of the BDS movement on its committee were five terror groups that are designated by the United States and the European Union as as uh, as official Islamic and Arab Palestinian terror groups. And I'm talking about the Hamas. I'm talking about the Islamic Jihad. I'm talking about the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the PFLP General Command, uh, and, um, and, uh, the, and, and, and two other Palestinian um, uh, terror groups. And uh, I mentioned, I think, Islamic Jihad, which is uh, a branch of the Iranian regime. So these uh, four or five designated terror groups that I just mentioned were the first members under, of the BNC, the, the Boycott National Committee, in Ramallah in 2008. And they fell under the umbrella, the organizing umbrella of something called the National, uh, the PNIP, the Palestinian National and Islamic Forces in Palestine. And that group was founded by Yasser Arafat and Marwan Barghouti, who was the head of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, uh, which is an offshoot of the Fatah, a terror group offshoot of the Fatah that both had Arab and Islamic uh, 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 ideology behind it. And they and the, the Palestinian National Islamic Forces, that's the umbrella group for these five designated terror groups by the United States and the European Union, they were founded in 2000 in the, as you remember, the Al-Aqsa Intifada in order to coordinate terror and political action against Israel uh, from Ramallah. Now, we have overlooked, um, I think, uh, PAC, uh, 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 communicating that, that the Boycott National Committee and the, and the BDS movement today which is characterized by, shaped by, motivated by, driven by the BNC in Ramallah, is basically uh, awash in convicted terrorists and designated terror groups. It's a very important point because what you see in the United States uh, as a function of the BNC, because the BNC by itself is not mentioned so frequently on college campuses, which is the epicenter of the BDS Destroy Israel campaign in the United States today, um, but the PACB, the Palestinian Academic and Cultural um, Boycott of Israel, that is the, which is a synonymous group with the BNC, that name, PACB, uh, is known in the United States. And they're sitting together with these same terror groups um, that I just mentioned to you a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, moments ago. Now, these terror groups are still constituent members and have representatives on the committee, like Hamas's representative, Hadar Eid. Uh, from Gaza. 
these people are uh, these people are supporting uh, terror groups in the morning and then engaging in what what we have come to know uh, what we have come to know as civil society or BDS so-called nonviolent uh, um, operations in the afternoon. So what we're seeing on college campuses and university campuses today is a is a intensifying and worrying phenomenon that is demonstrated by an organization called Students for Justice in Palestine. And it's you know it's the BDS has created a perfect storm, a perfect anti-Semitic storm, uh, masquerading as human rights uh, uh, and justice and equality, just as the BDS movement um, promotes on its website. But it actually is not only a, an organ, a, a national network with 250 branches uh, across campuses in the United States. It was founded by a former mid-level Hamas supporter by the name of Hatem Bazian, who today is a Ph.D. professor at Berkeley. Uh, and he himself has called for a violent uprising and subversion of the United States, not only uh, to deny Israel any kind of sovereign rights in the in the Middle East. This professor, Hatem Bazian, as some of you may know, began uh, as the he's the chairman of the AMP, American Muslims for Palestine, which was an, a direct outgrowth of three um, organizations that, that were either that were either shut down or designated as terror financing organizations by the United States government between two thousand right after 9/11 between 2001 and 2005. And the AMP was uh, populated by, by members of three Palestinian organizations, the, Israel, the Islamic Association for Palestine, Kind Hearts, and the Holy Land Foundation, which was designated as a terror financing organization shut down by the American government. So the AMP was the outgrowth uh, and populated by unindicted members of the three above-mentioned organizations. And guess what? Who's the president and founder of Students for Justice in Palestine? The same Professor Hatem Bazian. So you see that, that in the DNA and, and in, the, uh, in the chromosomal construction of the, of the leading BDS organization on U.S. campuses today, we're basically two degrees separated from Hamas and Hamas-supporting organizations. Um, uh, that were monitored and outed after 9/11, and this is a very disturbing. It's a very disturbing uh, state of affairs because for people who think that that BDS is really a nonviolent grassroots organization that wants two states for two people, it couldn't be. It couldn't be more the opposite case. It's 180 degrees wrong. The BDS uh, movement in the United States, its its Weltanschauung, its worldview, its direction, its motivation. Its self-identification stems directly from the Palestinian National Islamic Forces in Palestine, those five terror groups that I told you about, and, and their worldview, which is to rid the world of the one and only Jewish state. And I think that, and, and obviously uh, those who know, the Hamas, uh, who know the Hamas covenant from uh, 1987, and they know the Islamic Jihad, which is an outgrowth of, of the Iranian regime, the Iranian regime sponsors Al Qudsi is uh, probably the most overt uh, anti-Semitic uh, regime in the world, um, uh, denying uh, Israel and, and talking about destroying Israel as a nation state of the Jewish people. There is a there is a pronounced characterization of the new anti-Semitism here, and I and I think that uh, it's our view that uh, the relative discomfort that Jews have here in Israel as well as in the diaspora, with calling people with calling people out as being anti-Semitic, either because they deny Israel uh, the right to exist as a nation state of the Jewish people. They call, uh, they characterize Israel with language, wh whether it's uh, Nazi regime, apartheid regime, racist regime, war criminal, genocidal regime. This, uh, this uh, in our view, uh, and in, in based on the IRA definition, based on the State Department's 2010 definition, um, still to be even more sharpened, but you can even look them up as they exist today, are overtly anti-Semitic and should be called out as anti-Semitic. Uh, and, you know, so that leaves us with a big challenge. And the challenge is to be, to be uh, uh, I think, to be vigilant uh, and fair-minded when it comes to uh, criticism, uh, criticism of Israel versus 
the inadmissibility of Israel or the uh, the nomenclature used uh, by, uh, against Israel, which if it were used against individual Jews, there would be no question that it would be um, it would be anti-Semitic, uh, and that one has to become more comfortable with calling out organizations or people, whether it's Representative Omar, Representative Kleibig, Representative Cortez, or others that uh, that masquerade. Um, anti-Semitic tropes as legitimate criticism of Israel or attempt to conflate the two or attempt to, to trot out Israel uh, as uh, the world's uh, number one human rights violator uh, without any kind of context, without the facts, and, and by using in a completely inappropriate manner adjectives that would never be accepted if used against individual Jews anywhere. And what, we, and what we're seeing in Europe, by the way, is the use of these adjectives about Israel. Israel is a war criminal, is a genocidal entity, et cetera, et cetera, in order to intensify Jew hatred. Uh, and the, the anti-Semitic attacks against philosopher Alan Finkelkraut in Paris is a perfect example of that, uh, in which Israel, which was Israel, Israel who was found, that was founded as the answer to, to anti-Semitism in 1948 has now been trotted out as the cause, in inverted commas, uh, as the cause of anti-Semitism worldwide, in the, in the words of many detractors of Israel. So it's, it's kind of anti-Semitism has come full circle from classic to new anti-Semitism, and it's something that I think we ought yet become comfortable uh, with calling out in, uh, when, it's, when it's fair and proper and, and, and measured, uh, but not to be afraid to point it out and, and to act on it. And part of the, I think, the initial challenge here is to sharpen the current definitions uh, of, the, of IRA, uh, of IRA and, uh, which is the International Holocaust Remembrance Association, um, as well as the 2010 definition, that do mention Israel uh, when referring to anti-Semitism, but uh, they say, for example, denying the Jewish people the right to self-determination by claiming the existence of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor. Well, the words of uh, uh, apartheid, uh, bigoted, war criminal, genocidal should be added, I think, to, to the word uh, – to define the word racist endeavor. The word racist endeavor, as everyone knows here, refers back to 1974 at the United Nations when Yasser Arafat called – uh, Israel a racist endeavor by referring to Zionism is racism, which was then uh, cynically and uh, and monstrously adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1975 until it was repealed uh, uh, back in uh, in uh, or can annulled uh, in 1991. Um, so we have an awful lot of work uh, to do together, and, uh, and and while at the same time we ought to be uh, we ought to accept what is called the legitimate criticism of Israel. Nobody is running away from legitimate criticism, but too many times and all too frequently, we are seeing that the definition of legitimate criticism is not standing up uh, to, uh, uh, to the type of investigation that it should on the basis of symmetry uh, uh, and on the basis of fair, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, fair mindedness and the basis of, of, uh, of, of policy and action and not uh, characterizing uh, uh, the Jewish state uh, uh, with the type of incite, incitement and, uh, and language that would be unacceptable in, in any situation when, when uh, uh, launched at an individual as opposed to uh, the collective Jew, which is the nation state of the Jewish people, meaning uh, uh, Israel. So I'll just leave it there as a initial comment on the roundtable, initial comment on, on, uh, on BDS. Uh, uh, and open it up uh, for discussion. I will just mention on the BDS on the BDS front that BDS has been very effective in uh, enhancing, intensifying violence on campus against individual Jews, which has been something that has been overlooked in the discourse because the discourse has always uh, ha continues to focus on uh, what BDS calls the legitimate criticism of Israel, but that uh, in the classic anti-Semitic uh, uh, context. It has. Uh, we have seen a an upsurge in violence against Jews, uh, in violence against Jews on campus, on on hundreds of campuses across the United States, uh, using Israel as an excuse uh, in order to uh, in order to do that. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Dan.
as the moderator of this discussion, I'd like to ask you the first question. Um, and that is, um, in 2016, in December of 2016, in the, um, in the U.S. Senate, Senator Tim Scott was able to pass um, the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, and that was by a vote of 99 to 0. And then, as you know, in, in the United States, we need both chambers of Congress in order to make something U.S. law. And when it went over to the House of Representatives, um, then it was Chairman Goodlatte who would not let it go forward in the Committee of Jurisdiction, which was the Judiciary Committee, saying that the um, definition of anti-Semitism, which utilized at that point Natan Sharansky's famous 3D definition, was going to be an assault on free speech. And this this argument has been used over and over again. Um, we didn't, Annette would like to, um, to pull out of the weeds the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act because we feel it's more important now than ever before because of these horrific attacks of Jewish students throughout college campuses, um, among many, many other reasons, and because it is actually um, having a very, very deleterious effect on um, Jewish students' ability to feel pride in Zionism, to feel that they can advocate freely for the Jewish state. Um, but I'd like to know how you would respond to the um, argument that um, anti using employing the three D definition or the International Holocaust Remembrance Association's definition of anti-Semitism halts free speech. Well, we remember when the Nazis marched through Skokie, Illinois, and that was uh, protected by the U the the U.S. Constitution. There's no there's you, you you know free speech is one of the most important principles uh, uh, that in international. Um, international uh, civil liberties. I mean, it's it's uh, and it's clearly the United States. Uh, the United States uh, uh, has served as an example for the entire free world, and for, and and the non-free world on the issue of free speech. And there is a collision uh, between anti-Semitism and uh, and and free speech. And there's going to have to be uh, some sort of deliberation about uh, uh, what. Uh, what uh, what is considered hate speech, even though there are no laws governing hate speech in the United States, there are in Canada and there are in Europe, and uh, there is a there is really a question about whether uh, can hate speech be considered beyond the what's acceptable beyond acceptable discourse in the United States, taking into account that free speech is clearly an anchor of of uh, freedom and liberty as the United States has uh, defined it for the entire free world. It's a very complex, it's a very complex, it's a very complex question, Sarah. Um, at the same time, you know, the limits of free speech in the United States are those that you cannot call for uh, fire in a theater, as the example is used, and you can also not call for violence uh, against um, individuals uh, or groups. Uh, 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 using speech in order to uh, mobilize uh, that type of, of, of physical violence. Uh, so there has to be some sort of determination made that, you know, language is important. Words matter. And uh, to, in the context of, 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 of the, uh, the holiness, if you will, in inverted commas of, of, of freedom of expression, uh, there have to be limits uh, in the uh, in, in certainly in light of the fact that uh, freedom of speech was used to uh, to annihilate uh, uh, six million Jews uh, and uh, as well as as millions of uh, uh, and, and millions of others in genocidal acts, whether in Rwanda uh, or in other places, uh, uh, you know, using speech. Speech matters. Uh, so there's going to have to be there's going to have to be a balancing. Of, uh, of, of, of freedom and the rejection of, uh, of hate speech. And, and just before we open up the floor to more questions, I'd just like uh, to respond a bit to that, and that is that um, within an educational setting on college campuses, there are multiple, multiple protections for multiple minorities. 
because an educational setting is very different where the, um, the, the climate is not supposed to interfere with a student's ability to learn. Now, if you're trying to walk across the quad and you're wearing uh, a yarmulke or a kippah or you're a woman with a uh, star of David around your neck and you're spat a, a, upon and you're called in an ethan Zionist pig, that interferes with one's ability to learn. So we have multiple protections um, for um, black students, Hispanic students, students with disabilities, um, many, many other kinds of students, but we do not have them for Jewish students who so those, are those are those are university those right, those are university specific protections. Am I correct about that? Well, they're not university specific. They are the federal law that protects every single um, minority student with the sole exception of Jewish students on college campuses. So, and these are the ones that are the most singled out for hatred. In fact, in NYU, if you belong to Hillel or any other Jewish organization, you are not allowed to have any kind of involvement or engagement with any other um, um, collegiate group on campus um, because the anti-Semitism masked as you know, anti-Zionism has gotten to that point. So I think that when we're talking about free speech, um, we really do have to be careful um, to try to get some protections for Jewish students. In 1964, when the first Civil Rights Act was, um, was written, um, there were no um, protections for religions because people at Harvard and Yale did not want to have um, did not want to eliminate their quotas against Jewish students. And in every era, there seems to be some sort of reason why um, there are not protections for Jewish students. So I feel there is a double standard right now, and we really do have to very carefully, um, you know, be able to, you know, put this round peg into the square hole of free speech, but still afford some protections for, for our Jewish students who are literally being beaten up on college campuses throughout the Well, United this States. is going to require, uh, prescriptively, Sarah, this is going to require um, very strong, very clear, sharp moral clarity and political will by major donors and alumni of universities. And that there has been, a, unfortunately, the alumni community has failed uh, largely in these uh, on these campuses in order to establish red lines along the uh, along the lines which you're discussing right now. Mm -hmm. Well, number one, um, Israel. Just because people gang up on Israel doesn't mean they're right. Israel's I I presence in the West Bank is not illegal. It is it is legal. It is it is politically dis it is polit it has become a politically loaded issue, which is why people use the incorrect nomenclature of illegal occupation, which is which is which is a, uh, a, a, a misnomer and completely has no basis in international law. Occupation is a legal concept: the American occupation of post-war Germany, the American occupation of post-war Japan. Uh, uh, yeah, but it, but the Israeli situation is sui generis because Israel never came in to territory of a, another sovereign actor. So therefore, Israel took upon itself the humanitarian aspects of, of, uh, of occupation as a legal concept back in 1967. Uh, and, and, and so therefore, um, the concept of, of, uh, of hurling this accusation against Israel is totally unfounded because it, it, it's, a, it's mendacious, it's a lie, it's untrue. That's number no. number two. Uh, BDS is anti-Semitic because it, by it has called for uh, the elimination of the nation state of the Jewish people of Israel. From the, the if you go to any uh, major protest of BDS organizations on American campuses, you will hear this refrain. And if you during uh, my comments now, you can actually just go onto the internet and put in "From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free." Which is a, uh, a seemingly innocuous but but um, but very ominous uh, 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 refrain uh, that means uh, let's destroy Israel and uh, replace it with a 23rd Arab Muslim majority state called Palestine. I 
think she I think she has good speech writers. When when she says, look, uh, when she says two state solution, does she mean two states for two peoples? Does she mean Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people living side by side with a Palestinian state as the as the nation state of the Palestinian people um, in mutual recognition, uh, security, uh, and recognized boundaries? Um, I'd, I'd like to see Representative uh, Omar say, yes, I favor Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people uh, in secure and recognized boundaries uh, 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 as, as, part of the def- as part of the further um, uh, definition and characterization of what she called the two-state solution. I think that, uh, I think that Ms. Omar has a huge learning curve uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to climb in order to really to understand what's uh, what, what's going on in in the Middle East, uh, she clearly can't support the BDS movement if she supports uh, the existence of the State of Israel. But I don't think she really I don't think she really makes uh, any kind of distinctions. I think she's she's basically been educated in in you know in the madrasas of political Islam, which is uh, basically the the ideology underlying the Hamas uh, in Gaza and in the West Bank in Judea and Samaria. And uh, and she's a true believer. So I, I don't think that she's a, that that her uh, I, I don't think that her observations about Israel come from a political standpoint. They come from an ideological standpoint that by definition uh, uh, eliminates Israel. Now, that that's notwithstanding what she wrote in The Washington Post. But I'd like to see her uh, can affirm uh, what she's written with some much more specific uh, characterizations uh, uh, and acceptance of Israel as the nation state of the of the Jewish people in uh, in in defined boundaries according to Israel's vital uh, his, his own vital interests. Uh, yes, the the answer is yes. If you go on to the jcpa.org, um, you can find that uh, you, you can find that uh, b- attorney ambassador Alan Baker, former Israeli ambassador to Canada and former legal advisor at Israel's foreign ministry has written uh, the 10 answers to the 10 greatest uh, uh, accusations uh, against Israel. Uh, And uh, there are also many other short, brief articles uh, answering the occupation myth uh, and answering, uh, responding, countering to a lot of the other uh, invective that is uh, hurled uh, against Israel. Also, if I'm not mistaken, stand with us has done a very good job on this as well. Uh, so you can go to their website and get uh, very brief to the point answers um, from these uh, most common, uh, most common, frequently anti-Semitic uh, uh, accusations against uh, Israel and others of them are just ignorant. Hi, thank you, Eric, for that question. That's actually a discussion topic that we could all sit around over breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, and late into the night and discuss because it's such an important it's such an important discussion topic. Uh, I, you know, it, it, very quickly, I think there are a couple of points here. Number one, I, I, I do think, uh, and and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Daniel Gordis, my my friend and colleague from the Shalem Center. Uh, made this point at our roundtable last week when we were discussing these types of issues, and that is that the the uh, American Jewish identity as a general identity structure has changed fundamentally in the last uh, 50 years, um, uh, and that is from the post Holocaust uh, identity structure that put Israel very much at the at the at the center once Israel was established. Because we know that uh, there were um, many leadership forces in the in the, originally in the reform movement that were unexcited about establishing Israel as a, as a Jewish nation state. But once it was established, um, Israel, you know, American uh, American Jewish community became uh, very Israel uh, supportive, uh, and Israel really as the you know as the collective uh, Jew, as the uh, as the return of the Jewish people to the third Jewish commonwealth in history. And I think today we've moved very far away from that, where Generation Y and Z, um, today's 18, 19-year-olds, all the way t- into the 30s, are seeing Israel uh, as an irritant to their Jewish identity, not as, uh, not as an anchor of their Jewish identity. Uh, and I, I think uh, the, the notion of uh, Judaism as a universalistic social action um, uh, ideology uh, while 
while definitely part of Judaism, and, and you know, in Purim, as an example, we give gifts to the poor and, and, and send mishloch manot and send gifts to one another. Um, so that's social action. Uh, but on the other hand, here we have, uh, you know, as a Israel as the reflection of Jewish national internet of Jewish national identity of peoplehood. Uh, there, there are large uh, parts of our young uh, generation of Jewish um, men and women who do not w- experience themselves as part of a national Jewish reality, uh, um, but rather as a universalistic faith community. That I think that is a is a very important constituent. Um, element of the uh, of 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 what uh, of what of a distancing from Israel, and that opens the door, um, I believe, to anti to a lot more anti-Semitic activity against Israel and the Jewish people, because uh, there is an, there is a wedge that has been driven between Israel and its uh, and its um, its Jewish public here and a, a very different type of self-identifying Jewish community in the United States. That's one point. Now, point number two, I think you're absolutely right. And anti-Semitism doesn't go away. It just ducks its, its, its ugly head uh, for a decade or two or three or four, uh, and, then, uh, and then resurfaces. And the Europeans are saying it very clearly that, it, that, that today, where, whereas classical anti-Semitism has always been there and has never gone away, Today, Israel is the excuse for the resurgence of classical anti-Semitism. Uh, 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 any of you who saw the the monstrous uh, parade float in Belgium, in a, in a Belgian city last week, uh, with Jews and money ba- with Hasidic Jews and money bags, understands that uh, that that. Uh, Classical anti-Semitic tropes have not gone. Not only have they not gone away, they've intensified. And today, Israel and BDS and Palestinian, uh, or pro, so-called pro-Palestinian organizations like the Palestinian Palestinian Solidarity Committee (PSC) or PRC, Palestinian Palestinian Return Center in London, have become some of the greatest purveyors of classical anti-Semitism in Europe. Uh, just to make that, um, uh, just to make the third point. Uh, about uh, about anti-Semitism, and uh, uh, I think uh, you know that sort of gives us three points uh, three points for discussion. Okay, I would just like to close this by saying how um, for for many years I've been calling anti-Semitism a virus that um, you know um, like herpes that might go away for a while, but it seems to um, be immutable and it. It um, transmutes into different generations and into different forms. And um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs very recently um, wrote a brilliant article and gave a brilliant talk, actually, in the um, House of Lords about anti-Semitism. And it is he brings up the, the fact that whatever a culture values at that time, um, the Jews seem to represent the opposite. Um, in the days of religion, you know, we were considered Christ killers. Um, in the days of, um, you know, uh, uh, nationalism, we were a third, um, you know, a, 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 an um, alien, strange force that that was not to be trusted. Um, you know, in the days of um, um, science, we were anti-science. It really... You know, it seems to mutate, um, and it's it's extraordinarily depressing. Nonetheless, nonetheless, even though it is there, we have got to fight it, and fight it very, very precisely and with a tremendous amount of wisdom um, in this third form um, or this fourth form or who knows what incarnation we're being um, dealt with today where we have um, 6 million Jews, 7 million actually, living in the state of Israel, um, whose um, lives very much still are on the line, if you look at the map of, of the Middle East, and you look at you know Iran and how Iran has um, managed to conquer so much and is right now on the border of the Golan Heights. Um, <laughs> So we need um, we need to be smarter. We need to be wiser. We need to be 
um, a lot more forceful and, um, and creative in our responses to this present um, form of anti-Semitism, which is anti-Zionism, anti-Israelism. And we need to raise our voices and not let people think- like Ilhan... Right. Thank you. Um, Dan, I'm sorry. I'm done with my little preach. So uh, my little talk. So yes, Dan. No, I I um, just wanted to add one thing to what you said, Sarah, and that is it's absolutely critical um, for Israel, for the Israeli Jewish community and the American Jewish community to 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 convene and agree on uh, as much as possible on a consensus understanding of what uh, 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 of anti-Semitism using the IRA and the State Department definition. Because we mm-hmm. have to determine what is beyond, uh, even in our own community, what is beyond mm-hmm. the pale and what is considered legitimate criticism of Israel, which we have to, uh, w- which we have to deal with and accept. Because uh, you know everybody, you know, as as free Democrats, everyone uh, uh, accepts uh, legitimate criticism of ourselves and and our Jewish nation state as well as the United States and 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 other uh, countries around the world, of course. But I think we need we need to find as much as possible a common ground on this issue, because if the uh, if the uh, Omar, if the Elon Omars and the Rashida Tlaibs and and others, and it's it's just it's only now getting going, and it's not just the two of them, it's not just Congress, but they will if they succeed in driving this, um, uh, I would call it moral, ideological, ethical, political wedge, not political, but, but moral and ideological wedge between us on the issues uh, that are so underpin our identities and our, uh, our histories and our futures as Jews, and uh, together with the Jewish state, we're going to be in trouble. So I, I, I'm hoping that we can, we, can, we can really find together a pathway that says this is, this is in the uh, arena of legitimate criticism, and this is outside the arena of legitimate criticism. Excellent. Dan, thank you so much for your words of, of brilliance and wisdom, and um, I, we will be in touch, and we are going to keep working and fighting the good fight that we could promise you. This, thank this you all. This call is now concluded, and um, if anybody would like to make a contribution to Annette, you know, we are um, very, very much in need of funds to keep supporting the good work of our organization. We're on Capitol Hill almost every day. Um, we write and publish. We have seminars, and um, you know, all of the these calls um, are brought to the listener. You know, at our our own staff's expense, and we um, we we definitely can can use any kind of contribution that anybody can give us. Thank you so much. And um, you could go on our website at www.ametonline.org to please help us out. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day. Bye-bye. And a happy Purim to everyone. Happy Purim. Mm -hmm.